online, and she is a professor in ECMO and ECMOlogist, we will say. And I think that uh, she is the most suitable for continuing this uh, uh, this short but impressive session on ECMO. So, Justina, just give us a, in a short and concise presentation what are the advances in ECMO in interventional cardiology and surgery because we need to do it better in order to make more people uh, live. Thank you very much for, uh, for participating in our Congress. Thank you again. Thank you so much um, for the invitation. Um, so we can start with my presentation. It will be streamed from uh, Athens. And I will continue with um, some, um, yeah, let us, let us say uh, the ECMO um, um, did a journey from uh, the standard, from the rescue procedure uh, to the standard procedure. So uh, the topic of the presentation is protective ECMO um, during interventional procedures and surgery. Next slide, please. So this is my uh, conflict of interest. Um, next slide, please. Historically, um, in the, in, at the beginning of the ECMO and um, how um, ECMO was introduced in the cardiac or from the cardiac surgery um, and developed, it was um, almost always a rescue procedure. Until Caesar and Eolia trials, we um, have seen um, that, um, and, and since then, we have seen that ECMO uh, becomes more and more standard, and especially during um, the COVID, um, um, COVID period, um, it was the paradigm shift from rescue to standard. So uh, what we knew, uh, rescue provides a last resort intervention, and it was... Um, over the years, uh, when the patient is deteriorated, has um, severe cardiac or respiratory failure, and fails to respond to conventional treatment. And uh, nowadays, there is a change in the approach to managing patients requiring to ECMO to standard and protective organ support. And it begins uh, with um, lung protection, as we can see in uh, this um, slide. Um, and uh, ECHO used mostly for lung protection, but um, I would like to show some indications in uh, um, ECMO use also for uh, protective indications. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, let us start with the definition like protective ECMO is for lung protection during respiratory support, which minimize additional lung injury, avoiding high pressures and limiting exposure to harmful invasive ventilation. And this prevent further organ damage and improves outcomes by providing support before irreversible damage occurs. And uh, initiating ECMO earlier may uh, minimize ventilator-induced lung injury or avoid invasive medical uh, ventilation during away ECMO. And, this procedure is uh, used especially uh, for transplant and um, um, even during COVID, uh, we started to avoid uh, mechanical ve ventilation, but in bridge to transplant, to lung transplant is, um, is almost uh, standard. And another indication is ECMO uh, in trauma. And uh, several studies showed for this indication that early and even um, during the first uh, 72 uh, hours uh, ECMO implantation and cannulation for the patient may improve uh, the outcomes because of organ protection. And those patients even um, develop less uh, um, kidney failure, less, they, they require less dialysis and uh, may be weaned uh, earlier than um, different patients or com compare, compared to another groups. Next slide, please. So this, this was for uh, respiratory and uh, this is a bit different in uh, VA ECMO and cardiac support because uh, so uh, last year we had two trials, uh, the shock trial and the trial from Prague and both trials did not show um, the um, um, advantage or did not show the benefit of uh, 
VA ECMO uh, compared in, in cardiogenic shock uh, in, in uh, several groups. So the patients were cannulated, um, but, but the survival was uh, not uh, better in the um, VA group than in the conventional group, which um, started the discussion uh, when to open the parachute. And then uh, please, next slide. Very briefly, uh, because um, we we should not uh, draw hasty conclusions from from these um, trials, and uh, as someone says, the devil um, is in the details. Um, when to open the parachute? If the parachute is open too early, um, there is uh, maybe no benefit because of the further complications, and uh, if this open too uh, too late the patient uh, this is only the rescue intervention and and no benefit uh, um, and um, the the outcome is very bad so uh, the the aim in VA ECMO is still to define this window of window of opportunity and to find the slot when uh, the uh, VA ECMO will be just right and uh, protective and supportive in a cardiogenic shock for the patients. And uh, yeah, um, the, this is how the, the further investigation should focus on uh, VA ECMO in cardiogenic shock. Uh, next slide, please. But uh, the next in intervention and, and the topic I would like to mention is uh, ECMO in bleeding. and. Uh, this is uh, an example of a really protective uh, issue. And as um, my uh, previous colleague uh, and speaker mentioned about the microcirculation, this is what happened when we uh, lose ECMO in bleeding, in bleeding shock. So uh, in this uh, kind of uh, lethal triad of uh, coagulopathy, metabolic acidosis, and hypothermia, um, um, ECMO is... Uh, uh, very useful. Next slide, please. Uh, because when we understand the interaction between hemocompatibility and thrombogenesis, uh, we can see what what ECMO, how ECMO uh, is useful in this situation. Because it restores blood circulation, it provides temperature control until the decision or uh, further procedures like surgical or interventional, and it uh, protects the organ, protects the organ by reperfusion. And uh, of course, uh, so you cannot say ECMO is a therapy. It's not a therapy for bleeding or coagulopathy because it cannot stop the bleeding. But it's, uh, it's maintaining the uh, recirculation and the microperfusion. And in this way, uh, we should um, also talk about the protective ECMO in this uh, indication. Next slide, please. So um, this is the bridge to pre-procedural um, ECMO. Um, when we, as we said, um, ECMO for bleeding and then uh, next step to next procedure because ECMO is not the um, uh, therapy. And it always needs a balance because between patient's condition and uh, pre-procedural risk and uh, for example, anatomy or uh, technique, uh, what we are doing intraoperatively. Um, next slide, please. And um, so I do not have um, the counts or numbers um, for um, how many procedures, because we do not have, we, we should maybe explore the ENSO registry for this, but, but I found some, um, um, overview and review articles about the principles and indications of ECMO in general surgery and also um, for um, ECMO in non-cardiac surgery. And the first uh, paradigm shift is uh, means because uh, there is a shift from CBP, CPB, from uh, cardiopulmonary bypass uh, to ECMO intraoperatively. And, and uh, uh, for such risky procedures, uh, um, surgeons started uh, to use or to um, maintain uh, with interdisciplinary teams uh, the ECMO intraoperatively, or they 
uh, they had uh, patients on ECMO and, and uh, patients needed the, uh, um, the surgery. And in this, in this way, uh, we moved from uh, uh, cardiopulmonary bypass intraoperatively for risky procedures to uh, intraoperative and intraprocedural ECMO, even VV ECMO or VA ECMO. Um, and there are um, several beneficial uh, issues um, and advantages of ECMO, like the small priming volume, uh, short on, or long-term use, so it can be also bridged postoperatively, only centrifugal pump with less hemolysis, um, and uh, also ECMO can be used uh, without um, heparin or anticoagulation, which is uh, intraoperatively really beneficial. So it's not only VA ECMO, but also VV ECMO, which uh, may be used uh, intraoperatively. And it means uh, it's not only because of uh, the risky procedure, but the patient condition may be um, quite uh, deteriorating. And this is the indication to bridge this patient on ECMO uh, during the procedure or surgery. Next uh, slide, please. So the, the summary of a potential uh, indication and, and surgical procedures for VV ECMO is uh, more uh, like uh, the technical nature and the risk of hypoxemia intraoperatively, which means uh, any uh, cardinal resections or uh, um, huge um, segmental tracheal uh, uh, resections, all the tra tracheal surgery. And uh, um, next next point are um, um, kind any kind of injuries and. Uh, for VA ECMO, also thoracic surgery, uh, abdominal ob obstetrics for cardiomyopathy or pregnancy, and uh, the whole uh, area of uh, cardiac uh, catheter lab, like um, um, transfemoral uh, aortal valve replacement, mitral clip, and uh, ventricular tachycardia ablation. Uh, so uh, all those um, procedures can be bridged on VA ECMO for critical patients or if the patient is deteriorating uh, uh, intraprocedural or even uh, starting VA ECMO uh, preventively before the procedure will be performed. So all this is a um, kind of patient evaluation. Next slide, please. Um, and which, which means about the numbers, uh, this is uh, a bit um, older uh, systematic review. And just to, just to have an idea for um, uh, um, aortic wave replacement, transfemoral for um, TAVI, um, VA ECMO was used in, in um, so this systematic review showed about 5,000 patients. Um, and and 4% four, four of those patients um, uh, were bridged uh, with uh, VA ECMO. Um, next slide, please. And um, as I said uh, previously, it's, it's always uh, the balance between the patient's condition and, and technical uh, issues and, and uh, very procedural uh, risk. And for this reason, this preoperative, uh, so the, the team needs, uh, this is an uh, interdisciplinary team. Uh, it, um, the patient uh, needs a preoperatively uh, evaluation and such procedures um, are, of course, uh, for selected patients. So uh, um, all these issues and uh, all this uh, recommendation like further transport to the OR, um, anesthesia, monitoring, uh, volume and, and uh, transfusions, it should be uh, included in the local protocol. And uh, of course, this also beneficial, uh, the perfusionist or uh, who is maintaining the ECMO and monitoring the ECMO um, during the procedure. It cannot be the, the person uh, who is performing the intervention. It should be an additional team uh, and it should be also uh, someone who uh, can decide should the patient be bridged after the procedure or um, um, how, how to maintain, and of course, um, 
the anticoagulation uh, is uh, is recommended to uh, not to not to um, give uh, any anticoagulation for the procedure and and start uh, after monitoring uh, um, and uh, uh, after the procedure and to decide if the patient can be weaned or should it be bridged. So it's it's a bit an individual uh, decision and there is no guideline uh, for um, for this kind of uh, procedure and it's always also an interdisciplinary uh, decision and, and uh, team and decision making. Next um, slide, please. And, and of course, there is a huge danger of intra um, procedural uh, complications, which means if uh, on the ICU, um, it's easier to, man man uh, to manage the patient because uh, it's a stable situation and during the surgery, uh, for example, in case of bleeding uh, or um, another intraoperative technical complication regarding the surgery, also the ECMO flow may, may be, um, it may happen, um, there will be uh, blood loss and hypovolemia or uh, any kind of um, um, different reasons for the hypoxemia. So it's always um, the team um, who is maintaining um, the ECMO um, during the procedure, um, it needs to be uh, high skilled and uh, have a lot of experience with, with ECMO and managing um, ECMO and uh, for trouble um, shooting and uh, um, such, um, also such, such um, interventions for man managing the complication can be um, uh, trained uh, with a simulation and uh, for surgery, it's it's a high level of um, of uh, ECMO management. Next slide, please. And this one is, for example, um, an example for of of an algorithm how, how to manage uh, hypoxemia on ECMO with a flow chart. Uh, we also use it in our department. Uh, for select, so if we have a selected patient, even for tumor tumor resection um, or uh, trachea surgery, and uh, managing patient intraoperatively, uh, this is a good flow chart uh, for someone who is uh, maintaining the patient and and the ECMO, uh, just to to follow and to prevent uh, the hypoxemia. And this is also the aim of of ECMO for. Uh, thoracic surgery to, to prevent intraoperative hypoxemia and brain injury intraoperatively. This more for VA, like managing cir circulation and, and VV uh, preventing hypoxemia. Next slide, please. So just my take home message in the summary. Uh, so we have the paradigm shift in ECMO provision and we moved from rescue to standard and protective organ uh, support, and it's developing more and more in this direction. The periprocedural ECMO utilization is feasible. Um, we do not have uh, the exact uh, numbers. It should be uh, maybe included also in the registries. Um, and um, this periprocedural ECMO also requires comprehensive patient selection by interdisciplinary teams. And it requires um, experience in the disciplinary teams, um, including surgeons, anesthesia, perfusion, uh, nurses, the whole team, and guidelines on um, such uh, maneuvers and, and uh, procedures um, has to be developed. Um, yes, I'm open to any discussion. Thank you for um, your uh, attention, and I wish everyone a great conference in Athens. Thank you so much. We're a little bit short of time, so we will just ask if uh, Dr. Murjani is online. And uh, okay, and then we will have one minute comment from you both. Okay. <clears throat> so we can start from Dr. Okay. Kimura. Okay. Just a very short comment, then. Okay. Um, and then uh, for Dr. Murjani. Okay. Um, Dr. Aikin, first, uh, thank you so much for uh, very interesting research data. I'm so impressed. You are great imaging data. Thank you so much. And Dr. Swall, 
Uh, thank you so much. Oh, great overview. Uh, I'm so impressive. It's impressive with your presentation. Thank you so much. I have just a short uh, comment uh, concerning um, uh, Dr. Akin. I think there can be the, the, a, a good puzzle, uh, a piece of puzzle in, uh, in the patient adaptive perfusion strategy in the future, also for us during uh, pulmonary bypass. The only doubts I have a bit, because I'm a bit pragmatic and I'm a bit uh, simple, you know, I, I need a number. So I can imagine that it can be uh, really difficult to interpret the, 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 this uh, microcirculation. Do you think that we have for the future perhaps algorithm that get us a number as we have? from the narco trend for example oh, it was more a question sorry it was a question yeah, but uh, we can, we can talk with you on the yeah we do that on coffee break yes thank you very much definitely thank you. okay and this is not in online from cambridge i mean it's a huge ecmo center it's one of the largest ecmo centers in britain and hello Lorraine. how are you hello. nice to see you and thank you for a fantastic conference and two great um, presentations just a question for dr akin actually just um Fantastic technology, and uh, I think it'll be the way forward for a lot of how we practice. How do you see us integrating that into clinical practice? I like, loved your penultimate slide about the synergy with all our other markers, the crucial point being end organ perfusion. And I'm wondering, is it AI and machine learning that will ultimately allow us to develop this and bring this into clinical practice? Because the information you're able to give is fantastic. And just say congratulations again on the work that you're doing. Yeah, thank you very much. That's uh, well, the one million question is how to implant it in the clinical uh, bedside uh, decision. And I think the daily measurement by short snapshot measurements, which will give you bedside directly a, a clear uh, number, as uh, Hans uh, suggested as well, a number of the total vessel density beginning and then the DO2 and the VO2, I think that will be make sense to have that directly like temperature, you know, like a clip and then get the number for the, there's something wrong or there's something okay in this patient is, okay, according to the micro, micro circulatory measurements, you can believe this microcirculation or whether or not. Thank you. So we end the session. Okay, I'd like to invite Dr. Merkin to moderate 